we are in the sixth week of uh, our examination of the book of James. And uh, we'll finish up today the, the first chapter. We've spent uh, almost five weeks solely on, on the topic of testing or trials or temptations or variations of that. And uh, today we move, beginning in uh, uh, verse 19 through the balance of the chapter. Let me remind you of the context, because that's going to be critical as we understand and begin to and to begin to, to take the bridge, and that really is what this section is today. Take the bridge from that discussion on trials into the application that James has for it. We call this series Blue Gene Theology because it is indeed a very practical um, uh, yet durable approach to theology. It's, uh, it is James intent, and this is really, really, really significant. It's James intention as he's sharing these ideas and thoughts with us, not to, uh, try to give us some treatise on doctrine. Okay? Is it doctrinal? Sure it is. But he's not writing a book so much telling us how to be saved, but he's telling us what happens as a result of our salvation. So James is not so much concerned about this doctrinal how to be saved. James is concerned about the idea of, so if you are saved, how does that look? Now, when we will use that word saved, some of you, it's, all, it's just like fingers in a chalkboard. Some of you, it's a brand new, it's a brand new word. Uh, you hate it. It's, uh, you know, it, it, brother, have you been say yay and there's like five syllables in this for you that's not what we want to communicate at the same time i am not willing to give up the word because it's a good word and, and the idea is have you been saved have you been spared <laughs> it is so funny to see people put on sunglasses uh <laughs> it's dark over here sunny over there um it is so important to understand that what James or all the scriptural writers are, are uh, telling us is that we, if we remain in our natural state, will be condemned to eternity separated from God. I understand the date. I can read a calendar. I know it's 1996. And yes, we do believe in hell. We believe in eternal place. Where you, if you die in your sin, unrepentant, minus the person of Christ, you spend eternity separated from God in, in, in the awful place called hell. So we are saved or spared from that. That being the case, James really wants to get in our face and say, now, if you're one of those that say you're saved, here's what your life should start to look like. That's why it's such a great book for us. It, it, it is. In fact, today he even uses the imagery that the Scripture becomes a mirror for us. So all of a sudden now we look at our lives and we look at ourselves and we begin to answer that question, so then how should we live? What should our life look like? Should we be just like everyone else? Or should there be some distinguishing characteristics in our life that would separate us from the rest of the world? James has led us to the point where he understands or helps us understand that our trials and our tests and our temptation that we deal with in our life, those things are strengthened as we are saved by the word of truth. It's James' word uh, speaking of the scripture. Then he adds what at least for me, and, and it's interesting, this is the third time we've taught it, so every time we teach it, you kind of see a little something different or start to see how it all blends and fits together. To me, this is like a parenthetical insert that becomes an introduction. It's like James wanted to say, let's talk about tough times. Okay? Tough times uh, are, are difficult and universal. Every person has them. I don't care how big the smile, I don't care how much the, the money, I don't, none of those things make any difference at all. Your life is filled with hard, difficult tests and trials. Um, besides that, you have the things from Satan called temptations. In the midst of that, it's knowing who Christ is that strengthens me. 
now he starts to bridge it. What I want to do is read through the end of the chapter, then we'll come back and we'll just kind of break this apart, make some practical application. Now let me tell you, as we look at this, almost all that James mentions in these verses, almost everything he talks about here are items we're going to talk about in depth a little later. So I want to make just some, some real uh, uh, general observations, understanding we'll deal with them in, deep, in depth later, and then end with three points that he makes at the very end. Here's what he says. This you know. Well, what is the this you know? That's all the stuff we've been looking at. You know this, brothers. But let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of a man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, and that, become, that becomes now the contrast through these next few verses. Doer, hearer. Okay? The distinguishing characteristic he makes is a hearer is one who studies this and knows it, but there's no doing in their life. Okay? Here's what he says. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, that is, the law of liberty, the law of Christ, and abides in that, stays in that, not having become a forgetful hearer, but becoming an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet he does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. This is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God, to visit the orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. That's what we'll look at in the next half hour or so. Here's where he starts. He says, listen, let me give you some very, very practical advice. If we're going to tell you to do something quickly and to do something slowly, what we want to tell you to do quickly is be quick to listen. We have lots of classes now on communication. And uh, rapidly, we're starting to get more and more classes on the second half of communication. Classes on communication used to be almost focused exclusively on how to speak, how to talk in a way that people would understand it. Now we have classes on communication, a portion of which is on how to speak, but the other portion is on how to listen. I'm getting better and better. I used to be awful at this. I'm getting better and better at this. I used to sit, and as you were speaking, all I was doing was waiting for you. I'm going to give you, let you talk for a while. But all I'm doing is now waiting for you to stop and take a breath because I'm not particularly concerned about what you're going to say. I want to just drop the next pearl of wisdom in there. Boom, let's get it in. Rather than so, I was in a meeting the other day and we've had, uh, had this guy and we've had a hard time. He's just had a hard time with people. Everybody he talks to, he kind of walks away and everybody kind of goes, what did he say? And so this is the first time I've been in a meeting with him, and I'm kind of observing <clears throat> closely. And his communication skills are good in terms of the verbal. All of a sudden, we had he was making a presentation. We had some questions. And three times in a row, he was asked a question, and three times his answer was to a different question. I found myself three times saying, well, that's not what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. Here's what he's asking. This guy's communication problem, I think, at least in my diagnosis, was this. He can talk real well, but he doesn't listen and understand where the lick. He's got no idea what you're saying, Adam. So James says, here's some practical stuff. Be quick to listen. At the same time, be real slow to speak. He doesn't mean in cadence of speech. He means time. There's an old Jewish saying that says this. We have two ears and one tongue, and our tongue was put behind a wall of teeth to control it. 
that, that we are to be, we are to understand the, the, the deadly nature of our words. Now, when we get to James chapter 3, if you, if you right now are looking for a week to skip, that's a great week one. That's a good one to miss. That one is all on the tongue. That's on the, the old dog guy right here that you can take and just slice and dice and cut, and you'd never think of hitting someone or stabbing them or shooting them, but you would do a character assassination in a heartbeat. Okay? If that's you, you don't want to be here the day that we deal with that. The Scripture is clear all the way through on kind of the value of watching what you say, understanding that, that there is, there is a, a potential problem here. Ecclesiastes uh, 5, 1 says, As you enter the temple, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Proverbs 10, 19, Don't talk so much. You keep putting your foot in your mouth. Proverbs 17, 27. And I, and I like this because it's abs this one is absolutely true. The man of a few words and a settled mind is wise. And who doesn't talk much and mind is, is, is well thought through. It's at rest with things. He's wise. Therefore, even a fool is thought to be wise if he's silent. All you got to do is stand there and not say much. And it's amazing. People will give you credit for all sorts of profound thoughts. You just aren't even smart enough to formulate a question. But you come off real bright, see? Because this is good, solid advice. I want to be slow to speak, and I want to be slow to anger. Uh, some of us have this idea, guys especially, that, that I don't really get mad very often. And when I do, I just kind of explode and get it over with, and, and I'm one that can just move to the next deal very easily. Kind of like, Hiroshima. Just drop the bomb and just move on to the next deal. See, we need to understand that this thing of anger, this thing of anger will not achieve the righteousness of God. We are to be slow in this process of anger. Now here's what he says. Therefore, because all this is true, and again, look at the connecting words all the way through here. He, he begins with a, this you know, he comes with a therefore, then a but, then a for. Every one of these points is all connected together. Now, since that part is true, I want you to put aside all filthiness. Uh, since you understand the devastation that comes in this idea of anger, I want you to put aside all sorts of filthiness. That, that, that idea of put aside is, is literally get rid of. It's the picture of the snake who's crawling along and all of a sudden sheds his skin. Okay? I want you to shed. I want you to get rid of something. I want you to get rid of filthiness, and I want to get you, want you to get rid of any residue that you may have of that wickedness. And in humility, receive the word implanted. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to take this word, and I want you to, we talk about it, implant it in your heart or implant it in your mind. Or as the psalmist says, meditate on his word day and night, night and day. Get that word and get it in there. The word implanted has more to it than just the idea of getting it in the soil. It's also a nurturing thing. I, I, uh, I have to laugh. Uh, uh, Susan is, is out in the back now and putting these sheets over these things. We have this, these, uh, there's a... Uh, three or four of it doesn't even matter, of these pots that are just dirt and these little things, I don't even know what they are, and, and putting sheets over them and, because the frost is going to kill them. And then she has another thing around the corner, and I had never even seen that. I don't go back to that part of the house. Uh, and, and, and I said, what is that? And she said, that's a tomato plant. And I, I'm protecting that. I said, Suze, things are tight, but we can buy tomatoes. I mean, this is goofy. <laughs> We don't need tomatoes. And then she planted a peach tree. So now she's got this. She, she, I think this is in lieu of mothering or something. I don't know what's going on with her. But now she's covering up this peach tree. Well, that's the idea of implanted. Implanted carries with it this idea. Getting the seed in the best possible soil and then creating an environment where it has the best opportunity to grow where it's watered and it's nurtured and there's sunlight, not too much, but enough, and the frost and the cold is kept away. So I need to take God's Word and I need to implant it in my life. 
Now the key here, a one word. The key to providing an environment where the word will grow or where you'll even be concerned about this at all. There's one word that drives all of this. It's up there, you see it right in the middle of verse 21, in humility. We're going to spend a second on this. There is a big difference between being humble and being humbled. Between having humility and being humiliated. Uh, in the mid to uh, late 80s, I had lots of friends in the real estate business who I believe were humiliated. But that did not make them humble. They lost lots of stuff. And the cars had to go, and all of a sudden some of the houses had to go, and all of a sudden the son's tickets had to be sold out at the uh, corner on the arena, and uh, all of a sudden they had to make the sacrifice, they had to get rid of the cardinal tickets. <laughs> and all of these things had to go in their life. Okay? All of a sudden, all of these things are gone. They were humiliated. But they weren't humble. This is a huge deal. Paul's going to, or, or t James is going to say in a little bit, he's going to say this, God resists the proud. If you want to ensure that you will never grow spiritually and you will never see God work in your life, never, 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 here's what you do. You be proud. You get real jacked about who you are. We do this even in the Christian community in lots of subtle ways. We'll, we'll even say, uh, and I've heard men do this a lot, God, God did this, God gave me this, but the undercurrent of that is, why wouldn't he? Is he going to bless that smuck over there? Why would he bless that guy? Look at me. Why wouldn't he bless me? Look how sharp I am. Look how good I look. Look at how wise I am. Why wouldn't he bless me? God resists that. C.S. Lewis, in uh, the classic work, Mere Christianity, says that pride is a complete anti-God state of mind. That what pride is, is saying, I'm anti-God. I'm pro-me, I'm anti-God. How dangerous is it? Lewis goes on to say, it was through pride that Lucifer became the devil. And so much of even the Christian faith is structured in such a way that, that we allow God to be on the God shelf but we design him in our own image and likeness, and he never gets very big. Steve Forbes is running some interesting campaign stuff right now. It, 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 I, I find it interesting anyway. He said, it's time to get America moving again. It's time to get America growing again. And it's time for, what's the next phrase? Spiritual renewal. Now, I don't know what he has in mind, but I'm guessing it isn't this. I was at Bookstar uh, yesterday, day before, it doesn't matter. I went one, two, three, four, five rows, long rows of spiritual books. There probably aren't a half a dozen in there that are any good, but five aisles of spiritual books. See, and that's what the whole New Age thing is. New Age allows you to be spiritual and talk about God, but you talk about the power within you. So you have a religion or a form of religion that, uh, that has and grants this idea of God, but it keeps all the power, all the authority, all of the stuff within you. Even some of our Christianity has gotten that way. Talking about you like you really got something to bring to the party. Talking about you like you really, you're really going to be a player in this deal. So that all of a sudden, sermons become a little poem, three points, and a PowerPoint for action, and out the door you go. You need to watch this, because here's what happens. As you grow, here's the key to humility. As God gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, you get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. That's why you have to allow God to be God. And he is everything. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. You aren't. 
So I have to take that word and th- that word in humility. That's why pride is such an evil, subtle thing. I will tell you that in my life, most of my sin and almost all of my problems come from pride. How does it work? It manifests itself in a thousand ways on a practical basis. Many of you selected the uh, shirt that you wear today because of pride, because it has the right logo. Or the car that you drive. Or the place that you live. It gets a lot more subtle than that. Uh, uh, it's uh, now Christmas time. It's at Christmas time of year. It's the only time where everyone in the office gets together with their spouse. And you're waiting patiently for your spouse to come. Speaking to you as guys. And out she comes. And you say, you're not going to wear that, are you? Did you cut your hair? Why would you cut your hair? What are you doing? Well, ladies, let me help you understand what's happening here. He doesn't give a rip about your dress or your hair. All he knows is that for whatever reason, when you walk into that party that one time a year, every person in the office is going to evaluate his capacity at romance and love based on you and how you look. That's all that is. It's just pride. That's why when you're out at that Little League thing, it's, a, it's hideous to watch it happen. That's when you'll see that guy, and he's got that son, Robert. Robert's his son. And Robert's just not very good. And he'll be saying, look at Billy. Look at Billy hit. Look at Billy run. Man, look at Billy go. Sometimes he'll just leave it at that. But sometimes he'll close the loop. Robert knows what he's saying anyway. But sometimes he'll just go ahead and close the loop and say, how come you can't run like Billy? And how come you can't throw like Billy? Let me help you out with this, guys. Because he's got your genes. (laughs) (coughs) He doesn't have Billy's dad's genes. Okay? And you didn't run like Billy's dad. You didn't throw like Billy's dad. And here's the bigger question. Who gives a rip anyway how a 12-year-old kid throws a baseball? It's goofy. He's probably in all likelihood never going to make a living at it. And the damage that you're going to do to him is almost unchangeable. And you know why you're doing it? Pride. You don't even give a kid. You don't even give a rip about the kid playing well. You just want everybody to look at Robert and say, "Oh, his dad must really be something." See, it's all pride. That's how this works. That's why it's a complete anti-God state of mind. Now, if I cannot take this word in humility and embrace it, if I can't do that, I'm in real trouble. Now he gets down. He's not defining what it means to be a Christian here. He's saying, here are some of the things you ought to see as a result of your Christianity. You should be not just a hearer of the word, but a doer. Now, James is addressing a specific problem. He is not saying here, hearing's not important. Here's what he's saying. There are two things that are important, hearing and doing. And the problem he's addressing are a bunch of people that are studying and reading and they know all the answers and you want them to captain your team in Bible trivia when you get together and they got all this stuff figured out. Boy, they just know everything and they got it all and they understand all that Levitical law and boom, they can throw that up at you. Here's the problem. There's study, 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 but there's no doing. Now, let me be very clear. When we talk about a Christian... We're talking about a person who has the assurance of heaven not based on anything that they've done, but based on the grace that God has given them. So that all of my works will never result in my going to heaven. But because I am God, there are works that result because I'm His. See the distinction? So I'm not, if you will, I'm not saved by my works. My works don't result in my salvation, but, res- but works do result from my salvation. So here's what he's saying. If you're going around and you're pounding this Bible and you're shoving these Bible verses in everybody's face, but your life is a mess, there's no action, there's no doing on your part. 
You're probably dead and dry and dreary, and not a lot of people want to be around you, frankly. you got a problem. Let me give you the flip side, because James does not deal with the flip side. If you're one of those who's doing, and you're involved over here, and then you're in this committee over here, in this ministry over here, and you're do, 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 and you think because of all you're doing, God's going to say at the end of your life, hey, you really did a lot, come on into heaven. God isn't going to say that to anybody. God's not going to say to one person that's ever lived, you really did a good job. You really lived a good life. Ah, come on in. God's going to say you're going to be in or out of heaven based on the finished work of Christ. But understand, he's dealing with a problem of people who said, here's what we are. And he said, fine, let's see it. Okay? It, it, you need to prove yourself to be a hearer and a doer. It's not an either or situation. What James is saying is you got a whole bunch of people that are reading a menu. You got a whole bunch of people running around with car keys, a whole bunch of people running around and they've got a prescription in their hand. And James is saying it's way different between reading a menu and eating a meal. Way different between having that prescription in my hand and taking the medicine. Way different than swinging around car keys and starting and driving a car. What James is saying, it's way different between reading the Bible and growing in Christ. Those are two radically different things so now he starts to lay out the contrast if you're one of those who are here and you're not a doer you're like a guy that looks in the mirror at his natural face literally at the face of his birth you look in the mirror you see this and you glance away and once you've gone away you kind of forget what kind of person you are you kind of look and, and uh, you kind of lose track. And in the course of a day, uh, some very attractive young girl says something very polite and nice to you, and you actually think she's attracted to you, and you've forgotten that you're a fat, dumpy old guy, and she's just maybe being polite and nothing more than that. But you fancy yourself now as, as, as perhaps Tom Selleck or something. You've forgotten. You need to stop. You need to stop, get out of the mirror and go, nope, I'm a fat old man, and she's just working me. Okay, Boom. you got to go on to that. That's like a guy that's a hearer and not a doer. Which, by the way, ladies, ladies, that ought to give you a very practical tip. These guys are all ego, and you can get whatever you want out of them if you're nice to them. That's what I tell my girls all the time. And they're way ahead of the rest of the field at this point. Okay? But, now here's the contrast, but one who looks intently. Now, the first look... Uh, that first look that we had a couple of verses ago, that's a glance. That's a boom, boom. Look intently. That's a whole different word. That means to gaze for a long period of time, sucking in detail. It's the same word that's used when John and Peter arrive at the tomb on Easter morning. They stoop and they look intently. They're studying every detail. They understand it's a key moment and a specific time, and they are trying not to miss one thing. They're looking everywhere. They're analyzing everything and every detail. When you look intently at the law of liberty, what's the law of liberty? Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, love your neighbor as yourself. It's the law of freedom that we have in Christ. It's not the Ten Commandments. It's far deeper than that. Ten Commandments, frankly, aren't that tough to keep. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Christ comes along and says, you may never touch a woman. You may never be in bed with a woman or a man, and yet you've committed adultery in your heart. This is a far deeper, tougher law to keep. I look intently at this. I begin to understand that there is a code of behavior that the Savior demands and expects from me. I look at that, all of a sudden, I'm no longer a forgetful here. I'm an effectual doer. And now, in verse 26 and 27, I believe James gives you, and we close with this, the three points of what real religion looks like. It's an internal transformation that manifests itself in an external way. So that D.L. Moody said that God says to the Christian, love God and do whatever you want. Moody adds quickly, since I've become his, God has changed my wanter. 
That's what happens. Three things that take place. Here's the first thing. If any man thinks he's religious and he can't bridle his tongue, he's kidding himself. You're blowing smoke at You're deceiving yourself. That faith is worthless. Now, here's what he's not doing. He's not saying, here's the whole barometer is your tongue. Here's what he's saying. A person whose life has been transformed will exhibit self-control. The life of a Christian is under control. Make the distinction. Certainly not circumstances, because you can't control those. You can have gigantic fluctuations in the marketplace. You can have all sorts of... Susan and I are minding our own business and doing the right stuff. Uh, last uh, October, whenever it is, and the three kids run the red light and hit Sarah and get out and run away, that's beyond our control. Those things are out of our control. I can't control those circumstances. What I can control is my response to those circumstances. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Someone who has a religion... And by religion, we are speaking here of Christianity in the positive light. Someone who has a personal relationship with Christ is someone whose life is marked by steadiness. It's not fluctuating all over the place. It's not a constant going around saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because I'm alienating people all day long because I just react, 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 react to everything. There's a sense of self-control. There's two more things, James says. This is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God. To visit the orphans and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Here's the, here's the second thing. To do charitable things. Loving things. That's what, char that's what charity is. Charity is love in action. So that when Paul's writing in, in Philippians 2 and he speaks about Christ, he speaks about Christ becoming, was God, continues to be God, but takes on the form of a man. He said, I want you to be like Him. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. So when he talks about widows and orphans, he is saying, yeah, wi visit the widows, help the orphans. But the context here is far broader than that. He's saying in the Christian life, there is a sense in which we are looking for people who are hurting and burdened and in anguish, and we are bringing to them love and care and support. They may be married, they may be widowed. They may have parents, they may be orphans. They may be rich, they may be poor. They may be in prison, they may be out of prison. What he's saying is, you are the deliverer of the love of Christ to the people around you. If I know, for example, that Damien is hurting, what the law of liberty demands is that I am there to support and to encourage him. What this aspect says is I cannot live a disassociated Christian life. My Christian faith demands involvement. I cannot give love and concern and support to somebody if I'm not involved in them, if I don't know what's going on. That's the tragedy. It, that's the tragedy in something where you've got people who are hurting, 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 hurting all over the place. But either through apathy or lack of knowledge or ignorance, people stay removed. Here's the last thing. Keep yourself unstained by the world. I uh, did a men's retreat this weekend. <coughs> I've had three or four pretty interesting gigs here in the last few weekends all over the place. I, uh, I spoke at a theological conference on grace, and the speakers that they were Dr., 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 and uh, Tom, and uh, that, that was interesting. My opening line was, I'm a little bit intimidated when if we could take any of the other three men and convert their IQ to Fahrenheit, we could boil water. Um, that scares me a little bit. So that had its own little twist to it. Then the next weekend, I did the Southern California Senior Citizens Association, and that had a whole different spin to it. And then last weekend, I did about 230 guys from a, a church in Newport Beach. And uh, we had, it, it was the best men's group I've ever been with. It was unbelievable. Well, I'm getting the, I'm there, we're having a little cider or something, and we're talking, and I'm talking to this guy. And so I said, are you married? And he said, no. I said, oh. 
That's what we talk about. I don't think that much about it. We sit down to have a little snack. We do lots of eating and snacking at these things. I said, hey, how you doing? Good. Where do you work? Blah. And uh, married? No. So uh, I did an interesting thing that night. I just had talked to two or three guys, and I, and I was struck that there were a bunch of single guys there. Very rare for a men's retreat. So we're sitting in this. It's a great teaching setting. It's kind of an amphitheater. I said, how many of you guys are single? And I'm not kidding you. I'll bet a third of the hands went up. Really weird. Really weird for this. So I said, well, that means something. I don't know what it means, but it means something. I'll figure it out. So I'm kind of playing with this. And then finally, Saturday night. Saturday, this is the kind of church it was. Uh, they said, we have a tradition here. And uh, our tradition uh, on Saturday night is that uh, Tom, who's one of the elders, uh, Tom sends us off to our, uh, to our time of fellowship with a song. And it's one of his favorite songs. So we'll all get together. And all of a sudden, Tom goes, doo 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 And he does great balls of fire. It was a great place. Okay? So we're getting ready. And we're breaking. And these two guys come up. And I'm just telling you, they are just two stud guys. Just they, they, the hair is coiffed, the clothes are right. These are stud guys. They're kind of wandering over toward me. And I said to myself, these are single guys. So these two absolute huge stud guys come over. I mean, I, I was, it was, golly, they were good looking. Okay. I mean, they were just boom. Okay? And I, and they said, uh, have you figured out why all the singles are here? And I said, no. They said, we can tell you why. And I said, okay. And they said, because in Newport Port Beach, you can pretty much get sex anytime you want it and drugs anytime you want it, and everybody's kidding everybody else, and everybody's dressed a certain way, and everybody's driving this car, and, and we've made a commitment to not do that. And we have to be in an environment where we are encouraging one another in that, because if we get back out into that new, we're afraid we'll fall like that. It's the third thing that's here, to keep yourself pure and undefiled by the world system. We cannot say this to you enough. Your life is to be pure and holy. Doggone it, it is. The marketplace is not good over there. And understanding that is when I went to these guys in the course of the conversation and said, you know, I have lots of people who say, you know why I'm not successful in my business? Because I'm a Christian. And the implication there is, if I could cheat and screw everybody just like everybody else, I'd really be successful. Well, no, you're not. You're a loser is the problem. Okay? That's a loser mentality. The greatest asset you have in the marketplace is your Christian faith. People are looking for honest, sincere business, people who are service-oriented and want to meet their customers. That's a Christian. If you're a boss, they want people, the employees, they want a boss who's going to trade them straight and fair, who's not going to be up and down, Jekyll and high. That's a Christian. Here's the problem. When you start thinking that way, you've bought into the world system that says you've got to cheat to get ahead. That's what he's saying. Keep yourself unstained by the world's value system. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Okay? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. One translation says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. That's the constant thing. Listen, you as a believer are never, ever, ever going to be comfortable in this world. Your value systems are anti-world value systems. This world says, listen, money's important, and power's important, and prestige is important. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, God didn't use a bunch of people who were wealthy and powerful who had prestige, and everybody stopped and said, do you know who that is? Look at over there. You got, you got this, the Academy Awards are coming up. This is one of those things that always kind of strikes me as odd. Here are all these people who, who camp out to, to watch Jack Nicholson or somebody else, Brad Pitt, drive up and kind of nod at them, maybe flip them off, and, and walk in to the Academy Awards. What are we doing? But Jack Nicholson, because he's on the screen, has power. That's buying into the world system. I mean, those really are people, and I can understand, okay, let's do it and have fun. But, but let me tell you, those are people that, that need a life. You know, when you can sit and lip sync Gilligan, you got a problem, okay? <laughs> You know the next word. Whoa, this is a good one. Wait till you see what the skipper does in this one. Okay, you, you got a problem. You know, you need a life in the midst of this. 
all of a sudden we're buying in we're buying into the world's value system and here's what he's saying if you're a Christian your life will be distinctive it'll be distinctive in several ways number one you'll have control of your life number two there'll be charitable things in your life loving things not things that you're doing to please God but things that you're doing to thank him and number three your value system and your view of life will be different than the rest of the world and it will be driven by this that James chapter 1 verses 19 to 27 I really think is an introduction to what follows he talks about the tongue he talks about prayer he talks about worldliness he talks about faith and works next week he says you want to see some application of this it's interesting I almost was gonna skip this part next week because it could never happen nowadays they had a problem in their church where people with money and prestige were getting preferential treatment now I know that sounds silly to us today I mean that sounds almost goofy to us but why don't we just go ahead well, we will we'll just go ahead and take a look at it anyway and, and just see what happens there we'll look at it next week father thank you for your word thank you that it's real and true and uh, not only can be believed but it must be believed if we're ever to uh, experience uh, heaven uh, please Lord let these words today not be misunderstood our salvation is not a result of anything that we could do but it results in a transformed life we are not saved as a result of our works but our salvation does result in a work in our life God help us understand that you have called us to exhibit lives that are under control that manifest love and charity to one another and lives that are free from the pollution of the thoughts and value systems of this world God we cannot live this way in and of ourselves so we ask you for courage and for wisdom as to how you would have us live father we ask you this in Jesus name amen